anniversary of the founding of First St. Paul's. Each of you have a list of trivia questions on the table in front of you. Hope you've had an opportunity to look at that, to ponder them, maybe look at some of them, uh, visit with your neighbor about some of those questions. In a little while, I'll give you an opportunity to give you some of the answers for some of those questions. Also, please, the committee has asked me that you will please note the pictures where you go through the serving line over here on this side. The committee has asked, please don't touch them, if you will, or just look and pass on if you can, please. And then also, each of you will have pictures on some of the serving tables as you go along. I know it's a rush at the end to want to clean up those tables, but we want to save the pictures. Please do not destroy them if you possibly can. So, with that in mind, and keep in mind, also I want to make clear, this is a very historic moment that you're a part of tonight with the 140th anniversary. So with that in your mind, Pastor Henry, if you'll get us started with the opening prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the faithfulness to this congregation through the years. We thank you for the ways that you've shaped our faith and the ways that you've shaped our lives, for the, the ministry of the people who have come before us, and we look forward to where you are leading us. Tonight as we share this meal, God, we thank you for the food that we are about to eat. We pray that you bless it to our bodies and remind us that you alone are the bread of life. We thank you for those who are preparing this meal tonight, who have cooked and uh, are serving. Would you bless them in their service, Lord, and fill this space with your presence, fill our lives with reminders that you are always faithful. And now, all God's people say, Amen. Thank you, Pastor. All right, we're about ready to move. And so, uh, with that in mind, uh, I want to remember we'll start with this table. We have some visiting pastors here tonight, if you haven't noticed. And we're going to start with this table over here, where we have some visiting pastors seated. And then once they're finished, then we're going to start on this side. Not my decision, but too many things. Okay. And we'll be starting over here. Ushers, you go. And by the way, we will also have a free will offering that will be taken during the meal. So that will be coming through. Please help us with that if you can. All right, and Pastor Henry has said, once everybody is seated, the eighth graders will be bringing the beverages around for you, okay? So with that in mind, this table over here will get started. And once they're seated, the ushers will begin over here, and we'll get things underway. table. If you're at the end, would you start them please? Make sure that they come down. And by the way, we're going to feature some of the musical groups for St. Paul's. Would the adult choir please gather up here right now? Right up here in front? Right up here? Uh, where Ann is standing? And uh, while we're talking about that, we'll feature some of the other groups by the way. We'll have to been asked to tell everybody that in a few minutes passing the plate is going to mean something entirely different in this room. That's because the eighth graders are going to be coming and going to be collecting the dirty dishes and you're going to need to pass the plate. Yeah. And you can get more water and coffee if you want to. But uh, I also am fully aware that um, this coming November 11th is going to be a celebration in our country. But I wish you guys, you guys like that kids song that was there? Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. I praise the Lord for people who have volunteered to be a part of the military service and have agreed to try to protect us and our freedom. What do you guys think? <laughs> if you have been a member of the Army at some point in time, 
or have been enlisted in the Army at some point in time, would you please stand and be recognized? If you have been a part of the Navy, would you please stand and be recognized? If you have been a part of the Coast Guard, okay, we're in Nebraska. If you have been a member of the Air Force, If you have been a part of the Marines. Thank you for your service. Oh, the National Guard. Guardsmen. moment 
thought it might be interesting to tell you a little bit about a short scenario of what Hastings and Adams County was like when this church got started. So I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes here and try to tell you a little bit about that and the fact that what it was like. First of all, we've got to remember that this church was started in 1878. So keep that in mind, that date of 1878. Remember, it was just about 11 years prior to that time that Nebraska had become a state. And also, it was about 13 years that the Civil War had been over. So it hadn't been over that long, you know, as it go along. And I thought it might be interesting to share with you what Hastings was like in 1878. And it was very, very different as you think of it now. For example, one account that I found of a fellow by the name of Albert Cole said that he was from Michigan and decided to come to Nebraska because he had seen all this, the literature and advertising the free land out here in Adams County, and especially around Junietta. And so he decided to come. He took the railroad. It came as far as Sutton. And then he continues to say, we decided we had to walk the rest of the way from Sutton to Junietta. A little different, physical fitness, right? Uh, in terms of walking from Sutton to Junietta. And he tells when they passed the sign that said Hastings, there was nothing here. He said it was just a barren plain. There had been a, 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 a prairie fire that had come through. And he said there was literally nothing. He said we didn't, didn't even see any animals one way or the other. He said the buffalo, the antelope, they'd gone in search of greener pastures, without a doubt. He said there just wasn't anything there in that respect. Well, <clears throat> that tells you a little bit about when he came, and that was about 1870. Well, think about this. The census taken in Adams County in 1870, now that's two years before Hastings was incorporated. The census of Adams County, not Hastings, census of Adams County was 19. One nine, 19, was that one in the county. That was eight years before our church was put together and founded. Ten years later, in 1880, just to show you the tremendous influx of people coming into Adams County. The population was 10,235. In 10 years, how it had changed. Hastings was incorporated in 1872. And by 1878, this was a thriving community, so to speak. There were three newspapers, 150 buildings had been built, all of wood, Wallback Brothers Department Store was advertising men's coats for 25 cents. They were advertising men's suits for $2. Good corsets for 30 cents. They were advertising 20 yards of calico for $1. Well, and the railroad put a note in one of the Hastings papers that stated, we have a goal to put a settler on every 80 acres in the southern part of this county, or in Adams County, so to speak. Well, what about Hastings? What, in fact, in the, when, the, when the church was founded? Well, the northern boundary was High Street, or was 7th Street, as we know it. There wasn't anything on the north side until a little later. But when our church was founded, 7th Street was the northern boundary. Burlington was the western boundary. You had it was on South Street, was the southern boundary, and St. Joe was the eastern boundary, to give you some idea of Hastings and compactness at that time, in respect to what it was. Well, yes, <clears throat> and in September of 1878, the county seat was moved from Junietta to Hastings, and that's a whole story in itself, really. <laughs> well, the first religious service held in Hastings was conducted in a saloon. There weren't any church buildings. The first service was put together, but the people had a strong faith. They really did. The Germans were the largest ethnic group in Adams County at that time. There were others, of course, but the Germans were the large ethnic group. And the church meant a great deal to those people. It meant a tremendous amount to them as we go along. Well, First St. Paul's was founded by a man by the name of Henry Sigmund. This answers some of the questions on your little book there. 
Henry Sidman was one of the found. He was the founder of the church. He was a very wealthy person. When he died in 1925, 25, his estate was worth one million dollars. Now, that would be worth today about fourteen million two hundred and fifty dollars. So that gives you an idea. He had been a director of several banks around the area. He was a pastor. He had been educated in the seminary in Appleton, Wisconsin. And he was determined to start churches. And so he had started the one he started First St. Paul's in 1878. He started Zion Lutheran on the south side. He started, he started a church in Glenville. And he had started several others in Blue Hill, Tamil, Donovan, Grand Island. He was a mover in terms of beginning churches, Lutheran churches. Well, the German-speaking, and these were all German-speaking congregations. And of course, they were the ones in, they met a small frame building on 5th and Birmingham. It was just a small frame building that was there. And the church grew steadily as we go along. Then there was a Reverend Paul Berger that went along, and I'll move over this quickly. I don't want to bore you with some of the details and stuff, but some of the outstanding details that go along with it. A Reverend Ludwig Frank came to the church in 1908. And during his pastorate, the church became debt-free. That was his goal, make sure the church was debt-free, that type of thing. There was a J.W. Car uh, Car Carperstein came in February of uh, 1913, and he thought we needed to have a, more, uh, a much larger and a beautiful church, and so a new church was established at that time. It was built for $12,000, which was really quite a substantial uh, amount at that time. But 12000 was immediately pledged. There was no going around looking for money. It was immediately pledged just that quickly. Okay? And then the um, <clears throat> under the past group, we had a Frederick Motzkus, I think it is. The, uh, the new church building was finally finished then at a cost, I think it was of, of $16,000. It was dedicated in 1960. But they had to be so careful. First World War was underway. There was a lot of anti-German sentiment, and there were a lot of German-speaking congregations, which caused some real problems, without a doubt. And so, yes, I think, I think it was, yes, it was in 1918, there was enough pressure that finally on Sunday evenings, they had services in English. But those were the first ones, because there was so much anti-German sentiment. Then finally, there was a Julia Huber who came in 1919. He stayed for seven years. Some improvements were made to the church and the parsonage. Then a Dr. Frederick Schultz came to the congregation in 1926. The membership of the church then was 330 confirmants and 450 baptized members. But by 1946, now remember, the Second World War now was over. Membership was 450 with 825 baptized. Notice how it is growing. Some neighboring property was purchased, and Sunday school was established, it went along with that. And then, of course, the Reverend Schultz had stayed for that period of time. He stayed until 1947. He stayed 21 years. It was a long time for a senior pastor to stay at one church. And then he retired from the ministry. Reverend Alvin Havacost then assumed the pastor for the next two years, following Reverend Havacost. Um, Reverend Paul DeVries was called during the year of 1950 and his family came and they began a 12-year ministry at First St. Paul's and the church grew at a rapid pace under his leadership and in 1915 the new parish education building was uh, built and put on and then in 1952 the second step was completed the new parsonage was put up and, where they, and Pastor DeFries moved into the $39,000 home that, where the parsonage is and this type of thing. Okay, then in 1950, by the way, that was also the year we had the first rally dinner, too. We're going along that type of thing. In 1956, membership numbered 1,075 adults, 1,975 baptized souls in order to serve, better serve our church, because this church was growing so rapidly during the 50s. We had uh, called a deaconess, maybe you remember, there was a sister, Dorothy Stalder, that came to help with her, that type of thing, and she served as a parish worker for eight years then at First St. Paul's. 
the congregation that had worship had a homecoming Sunday, and uh, some also remodeling was done at the church. Had the, the balcony, the choir loft was all put in then, double the size that we had for seating. Now we can seat over 700 people, we couldn't before. And the approximate cost of this building program was $147,000. And then by 1957, First St. Paul started broadcasting on KHAS Radio. 1966, membership of the church had grown to 1,465 communicants, 2,500 baptized souls. New pipe organ was installed and dedicated. First assistant pastor was called 1954. Pastor Conrad Schmitz, who served three years in Hastings, and then Pastor Tom Holcomb, called after he left. And then, of course, uh, after <clears throat> then we moved on with Pastor Theodore Johnson. He had a heart attack and had to retire at that time until his death in August of 69. Then we have the Dr. Leland Soker, who was the head of the Rocky Mountain Synod. He came and assumed the senior pastorship. He began his duties in 1970, and then we began a complete study. All right, now I'll help you with some of the um, answers on your, uh, on your uh, no, first of all, I'm going to read the uh, pastors that we've had. I've already told you about some of them. Uh, we had, I ended with Tom Bocum being the assistant pastor in 67 to 83, Leland Soker. Then we had Neil Bosey, who was here from 1980 to 85. And we received a letter from him, and so uh, Noel Klein is going to come up and read that letter to you, please. Neil writes to us, the Congregation of First St. Paul, I write to congratulate you on your 140th anniversary of the congregation. I was very happy to serve as senior pastor of First St. Paul from 1980 to 1985. We are blessed with an outstanding staff and many, many members devoted to doing what needed to be done in order to serve the needs of others, both in and out of the congregation. As mentioned, I feel blessed to have the opportunity of serving for St. Paul's and wish you the very best in the future. Sincerely, Pastor Neil Bosey. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Noah. All right. We, uh, and then, of course, Neil Bosey. We had Robert Hansen, who was the assistant pastor then. And following him was Harold Stromer, Harold and Kathy Stromer, who were here from 86 to 2000, and we have a note from him also. He writes, Dear, fr dear friends in Christ, Kathy and I have been in Arizona now for nine years. We've missed not having the, the connections with our church friends in Hastings. He's been reading John McCain's book that was released shortly before his death called The Restless Wave, and in it, he speaks of the power of accumulated memories. He writes that we accumulated memory, fond, and unforgettable memories being with you as your pastor for 15 years, working together as God's people. As you now come to this very special anniversary occasion, we thank God for this wonderful history of 140 years at First St. Paul's. Blessings on your celebration and strong future. Greetings and prayers to each of you. Cordially in Christ, Pastor Harold and Kathy Stromer. Thank you, Under Harold Stromer, we had the following pastors. We had Keith Brozek, if you remember Keith, and he sent us a letter also. And uh, I'll share some of that. This is, this is a little bit longer. It goes along with that. He says, congratulations for St. Paul's on your 140 years of ministry. It's hard to believe it's been over 30 plus years since I started as a pastor for St. Paul's. Some of the memories that come to mind are the times I spent with a high school youth group going on the youth room in the basement of the Parsonage, going on those youth trips, going to Worlds of Fun, Oceans of Fun, trip to Branson to watch the pageant and so forth. Who can forget the lock-ins where we played hide and seek, where one person hid so well we didn't find them till morning. <laughs> Many memories of the youth group. I remember working with the men on the parking lot in the back of the church. A lot of concrete poured that summer. And of course, who can forget the food? We said food for our Lenten dinners, pies at the ice cream socials, food for those Wednesday night gatherings, so many memories packed into a short time we spent in Hastings, yet forever engraved in our hearts. Sorry I cannot be with you on this night, but you're in our thoughts and prayers. First St. Paul's was my first call as an ordained minister to remain my first love in church works, God's blessings. That was Keith Brosick, and then we followed with 
Uh, remember Howard Franzine was the calling pastor during that time period. And we also had Kathleen Casper. You remember she was an assistant pastor? And we have a note from her that reads as follows. It says simply, the saints of God belonging to the Church of Jesus Christ. Greetings. I remember my time at First St. Paul's with the greatest of joy and gladness. You were the congregation I served as a pastoral intern from 95 to 96, and then as a pastor. You broke me in, so to speak. Thank you for doing that. Tonight, you're at the Adams County Fairgrounds for your 64th annual rally dinner. I remember the very first time I saw the fairgrounds. It was the Fair Fest of 95. I have been asked to bless the animals. I've never done anything like that. <laughs> you are also celebrating your 140th anniversary. So great. You faithfully served our wonderful God and Jesus and Son. You had your share of challenges, but those have been few compared to the many years of tremendous blessings. It doesn't take the IQ of a rocket scientist to know that trouble is increasing on the earth. Nevertheless, the strategy for living and serving our Lord remains the same. Stay focused on Jesus. Set your affection on him continually. Don't turn to the right or the left. He's promised to never leave or forsake you. He'll lead, guide, and direct you. He's your place of safety, your rock. <coughs> May our God bless you with perfect peace and great joy, with great love to you all, Pastor Kathleen. Well, then we, of course, get into the near time period. We have Pastor Kathleen. Then we had Stacia Vick, who followed them in 2001, 2003. And under uh, Stacia Vick, we had his assistant, we had Frank Kirkemeyer, who is with us tonight. And we'd like to have him come up and say a few words. You know, I always cautious about asking a pastor to say a few words. But, uh, but uh, we'll take a chance. <laughs> Well, thank you for such a warm welcome, and it's so encouraging to see so many familiar faces here tonight. I was asked to share a memory, and when I look back, I found one that it's a memory about the meaning of faith. It's a memory of a special baptism, but it's also a memory about what it means to be the church. For me, it was the realization when the scripture verses came alive for me. It's in, found in our baptismal liturgy. The words were, when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Well, it was over 13 years ago, just before I received a call to another congregation, it was in the middle of the night, about midnight, when I received a phone call. Could I come to the hospital right away? A little boy had been born, but he was having difficulty. Would I come and baptize him? Well, I raced to the hospital to find four nurses working with the tiny infant. The worried parents informed me that were, the child was to be flown to a children's hospital in Omaha very soon to diagnose his condition just in case, would I baptize him? We gathered around the incubator, and the little infant was given the name Gabriel in his baptism. As I left the hospital that evening, I remember seeing the helicopter life flight him away that evening. Unfortunately, the next morning I received word that little Gabriel had passed away. He had been born with a malformed heart. Later that day, the parents asked if I would conduct his funeral. Well, on the day of his funeral, little Gabriel's casket was so small, it only took one person to carry him. As I stood there before the service, I felt one of those nudges, one of those nudges that I knew was coming from God and I needed to check it out. God was in a way leading me to simply carry Gabriel into the funeral service. Well, whether from anxiety or sadness, I didn't act on that leading. But at the end of that funeral service, I again felt that nudge, but even stronger this time. So I simply asked the funeral director to place little Gabriel in his casket in my arms, and I carried him out to the hearse. We drove to the cemetery, and I carried little Gabriel to his final resting place. I knew that was the right thing to do. It was not until several weeks later that I came to a spiritual realization that, in a way, sent shivers up my spine. 
You see, I realized little Gabriel was the first person that I had actually baptized, carried the baptism, and then carried to his grave. But that also meant that he had the hope of the resurrection too. This gave me hope and comfort. I knew that I had carried Gabriel from baptism to death to the hope of the resurrection, from lost to found, from blind to see, from an enemy of God to a child of God. And from that event, I also saw what it meant to be the church. You see, there was such an outpouring of empathy, love, and support from the people of First St. Paul to this grieving family, and especially an anonymous and unknown elderly woman who came to the visitation and provided a picture of Jesus holding a little child. That brought so much comfort to the grieving mother. And when I saw that people were carrying this grieving family from sorrow to acceptance, from despair to comfort, from being alone to being welcomed, from hopeless to hopeful. And isn't that just what the church is supposed to be about? We're there to carry people from baptism throughout life unto death so that they too have the hope of the resurrection. In this life, we are to carry people from shame to acceptance, from guilt to forgiveness. We're to carry people from lost to found, from enemies of God to children of God. We are to carry people from sorrow to acceptance, from alone to being welcomed, from hopeless to hopeful. We're called to carry people from their baptism unto death so that they too have the hope of the resurrection. So as you celebrate your 140th, be thankful that this church has been and continues to carry people from that baptism unto death to the hope of the resurrection. That you are out there giving people hopeless to hopeful from lost to found. And thank you for the opportunity that I too could be a part of that journey as your pastor and how you carried me with grace and acceptance as well. God's blessing as you continue your ministry to carry others. Thank you. Appreciate that. We have Steve Neal here also, and I don't have the years on that, but if you'll come up and uh, can you uh, give us a few words, please? We don't want you to fight about it over there. <laughs> good evening. It's good to see you all again. Uh, um, wow. So, um, yeah, so I came in 2004, right? So the chronology, um, I became, I'm not sure when I joined. I don't really know. That's so, so long ago. All right. So I went to Hastings College from 2004 to 2008. And after my first year of college there, I became an intern for First St. Paul's. Um, and I was probably one of the worst interns imaginable. I mean, I was, I, I showed up for my, you know, 10 hours a week sometimes, um, but, but I worked with the youth uh, during those three years and um, loved every second of it. Uh, graduated from Hastings and moved to Kearney, um, came back to serve at First St. Paul's in January of 2011, uh, January 15th, and moved into that parsonage, that beautiful brick building there on the corner. Um, one of the best blessings that our family has had was to live in there. And I served uh, for two and a half years. Um, two and a half as an interim youth director. <laughs> Doing a lot of different things. Again, working with the, with the youth, and I loved every second of it. Um, there's a lot of different stories I could share about that time, but I think, really briefly, I want to share how formative, um, looking down, how formative it was for me to, uh, to find a bit of a preaching voice while I was with you all, to pull back the curtain, um, kind of like a Wizard of Oz curtain, and see kind of what goes on behind the scenes of how a church works, how a church runs, of how it operates, um, to be part of a staff, um, to serve people that are committed to our Lord and Savior, to learn the, how to teach people about Jesus. Um, those of you that don't know, uh, probably most of you, um, I'm now uh, an ordained pastor. I serve uh, St. Mark's Lutheran Church in uh, St. Paul, Nebraska, so just 
half an hour north of Grand Island. Um, but that sort of formation that I had of how to do spiritual leadership, how to do pastoral care, came serving, you find people here at First St. Paul's. It set a foundation. I had a wonderful teacher, somebody that, 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 that says, hey, you know, um, you are particularly you, and you have your own voice. That was one of the best gifts that Joel gave me while I was here, is that, uh, is that he let me preach, and he didn't read my sermons beforehand. Maybe sometimes he should have. <laughs> um, but help me to find my own identity, which can be so hard to do. Uh, so Joel, I'm thankful for that. Um, and for each and every one of you uh, that, that were sometimes even awake at the end of those sermons. Um, I did learn what, the biggest thing I learned from Joel though, and, and, and the people that I serve now remind me of this. Um, sometimes in about the second or third paragraph of a sermon, if I haven't worked in like a joke or some way to really make sure people have attention, um, and that I have people's attention, I'll ask them, um, well, I'll tell you what, if you've ha had a pastor ask you to raise your hand in a sermon, would you raise your hand? <laughs> it's about the best trick I know. <laughs> Top by yours truly, Joel Rivers. Um, I truly cherish the time that I had to serve you all, and I'm so thankful to be back here. I love you, Joel. Um, thank you so much for having me back. And then we had Pastor Joel, who came and was serving as our pastor. And then, of course, Adam White came. And we were sitting at the table over there, and Adam's first question to me was, how much time will you give me? <laughs> well, I kind of stuttered and said, I've only got 14 pages prepared, now, so I think we'll cut that in half. <laughs> Grace and peace to you, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you, First St. Paul's. I bring you greetings from the Lutheran Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where I serve as campus pastor. Our worshiping community is preparing to have a worship service in about an hour and a half. That's how we roll at UNL. It's late. That's what it is. It's late. Always late. Yeah, I don't know where to start tonight, which is why I needed a limit. And you've made it harder, because when I showed up today and you kept coming up to me and greeting me and saying kind things to me, deserved or not, sparked memory after memory after memory. I remember the last time that I was at a rally dinner. It was crazy. I rode in on a motorcycle. <laughs> right? If you remember that, that the Nebraska Synod was doing this thing where we were buying motorcycles for pastors in Tanzania, and you all had sweatshirts that looked like they were Harley Davidson on them for a while. We rode motorcycles into this place. It was crazy. You know, I, I can tell you about the first mission trip that we went on with youth at First St. Paul's. I remember it vividly. We, we went to Juarez, Mexico to build a house, and we had a big group of students and Mona Mueller, <laughs> who celebrated her 75th birthday in a desert campground surrounded by barbed wire in Juarez, Mexico. It was crazy. And I remember when we were driving out of Mexico, a couple of days later, there was a student that throughout the trip had only wanted to buy something on the black market. That was their goal. <laughs> Fortunately, we couldn't tell them where the black market was. So as we're driving out, that student again talking about the black market is saying this, and I'm driving and Mona is in the passenger seat next to me. And as sometimes happens when you're at the Mexican border, there were vendors coming up selling bootleg DVDs. And someone said, Mona, buy one. <laughs> and Mona rolled down her window, and the gentleman outside stuck up Shrek 3. <laughs> and Mona bought it. <laughs> and as we crossed the border with our illegal copy of Shrek 3, we popped it in the DVD player and watched it. It was originally done in Spanish and overdubbed in English. Awesome. <laughs> I could tell you about how when my first daughter was born and I was serving here, there was a crazy thing that went down. Some people thought they should throw me a shower for my daughter. And we had a man shower at the birthplace, right, Harvey? And the, and the men of the congregation came out and they did all the stuff that happens in a normal baby shower, but with men. 
some memories that are fantastic and memories of joyful things and there are memories that are difficult and hard. In my time here, I got to see amazing collaboration take place. I found myself in amazing conversations and I also found myself at times in very difficult conflict. And all of that was part of what it meant to be part of this community. And even as I continue in ministry, I reflect on all those things. You know, when, when, when I think about collaboration in this place. There's so, so many stories that I could tell. Things that Pastor Joel and I thought up together that we never should have thought up together. <laughs> that we ended up doing in the life of this congregation. There's story after story. Things like the motorcycles at the rally dinner, right? When I think of conversations, there's one thing that came to mind tonight. Um, I remember when I came here really early on in my tenure, I was just out of seminary, sort of bright-eyed, and when I was in seminary, I, just at the end, I had fallen in love with the traditional liturgy, and I read a lot on it, and I thought I knew a lot about it. And I remember one time, I was in a worship committee meeting with the venerable Ron Bieber. Right? And if you didn't know Ron, if you don't know Ron, Ron is a legend in this community. I went to Hastings High growing up, and everyone knew Ron Bieber. And when I came to First St. Paul's, I knew that Ron knew everything about First St. Paul's. And he kept those records for years. So I'm in this meeting with Ron Bieber, and he said something really cool about the liturgy. And intending to give him the greatest possible compliment I could muster, I said, Ron, you're a liturgical nerd. <laughs> Wrong move. So days later, I'm hanging out in my office, right? Thinking everything is cool. <clears throat> no, and Ron knocks at my door. He comes in and says, Adam, I'd like to discuss something with you. I said, cool. I'm going to keep talking a little bit more. I said, cool. And Ron comes in, and he's got a Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> and he says, you know, you called me a liturgical nerd. And a nerd, he reads it to me. I don't remember what it said. But it wasn't very flattering the way the Webster's put it. <laughs> so I said, Ron, that's not what I meant. I mean, that is a really big compliment. Like, you know this stuff, and you care about this stuff, and you're passionate about this stuff. I meant that as a really affirming thing, and Ron just looks at me deadpan and says, that's not what Webster says. <laughs> and in those conversations about seemingly small things, I learned to listen better. And I learned that I wasn't the expert that I thought I was. And those small conversations that you shared with me, they shaped me. And I hope have made me into a better pastor. When I think about difficult conversations and conflict, it's a more recent memory that comes to mind, and one that is truly difficult for me. One that comes out of my work as a campus pastor. Just a handful of years ago, Evan Hine died unexpectedly, a member of this congregation, when he was a student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'd known Evan. I'd taught Evan's confirmation classes, and Evan had been engaged in the campus ministry that I served. It was hard for a lot of reasons. One was, in truth, there were still difficult feelings and open wounds from First St. Paul's leaving the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. In me, and I think in others. And when Evan passed away, I was at the hospital. And after we had spent time with Evan's body, with the family, Evan's dad came to me and he said, we want you to do the funeral with Pastor Joel at First St. Paul's. Can you do that? And I looked at Evan's dad and I said, I don't know. I don't know if that can happen for a number of reasons. Some of those reasons were my own. I called Joel that night. I told him the conversation that we had. And Joel wanted to create an openness that we might do that funeral together at First St. Paul's. And I talked to my bishop, Bishop Brian Moss, the next day. And he felt that it was appropriate for us to do that together. And I have to tell you, it was hard for me to come back. It was hard for me to step into that pulpit again. And it was hard to mourn Evan together. It was a terrible, difficult moment. 
but it was a powerful moment. Joel and I both preached. We shared the liturgy together, and you all showed up to remember Evan. In collaboration, in conversation, in conflict, you all taught me what it means to be a pastor through all of those things. The truth is, being in ministry is entering in to joys, to dialogues, and to the suffering of others. When I came here 15 years ago, I just graduated with a seminary degree from a Nazarene seminary and a grown up Presbyterian. I didn't know what my identity as a minister was. And through our shared life together, I discerned not only that I was called to be a pastor, but that I was called to be a Lutheran one. You're the congregation that turned me. <laughs> and it strikes me for all kinds of reasons scattered around this room today. But that seems to be something you have a knack for. Inviting people into ministry and giving them a way to see what that future might look like for them. I think about Steve, who followed me here from Kansas City. I don't know why. <laughs> and the way that you continue to draw that out of people, that's a gift. So what I want to say to you tonight is this. Thank God for God's faithfulness over the past 140 years. Thank God for what God has done through you and through this community. Thank God that through all kinds of things, through celebration, through collaboration, through conversation, and even through conflict, God has been at work at, among you. And that's what God does. God shows up even in the most unexpected of places. And as Christians, we look even to death with the expectation of the resurrection. Thanks be to God and thanks be to God for the gift of First St. Paul's. Thank you, Adam. We had Paul Koenig as an intern, and of course then we had Joel that had come earlier, and then we had, of course, Pastor Andrea, who joined us in 2016, and we would be remiss if we didn't note also the assistant and the fine work that Becky Mullen has done for us also. We appreciate it. Now, okay, I think that finishes my part now. And so Noah, um, Noah Klein is going to come up and talk a little bit. And, oh, that's right. You wanted to answer some of the questions, didn't you? <laughs> Okay, our first question was, how many senior pastors does our church have? How many? 17. 17. Okay, and of course I've listed them for you, so you know that. First St. Paul's has always been located in the corner of 5th and Burlington, true or false? That's true. And although the wooden frame structure was moved slightly when it was moved to 5th Street, when the, um, when the brick church was being built. What happened to the North Tower that it looks different from the South one? <laughs> in 1952, lightning struck the North Tower. It caused significant damage. At one time, a tall metal spire was contemplated for the North Tower. And that's the story on that one. The founder of our congregation, I told you about that, about Henry Seekman, how he had done that and returned to do that. What other names has our congregation had? German Evangelical Lutheran Church, German Lutheran Church, St. Paul's German Evangelical Lutheran Church, German First St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran, First St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church, a lot of them. What is the average stay for a senior pastor? Not quite eight years, just about eight years, just about 7, 28 or 9 or something like that. How much did we pay for the first lot on Burlington? Well, according to the original deed, we paid $80. Okay. Um, many of you should be able to get number nine. We used to have a summer service elsewhere. Where? Right, exactly, Chautauqua Park. What's the largest number of children enrolled in Sunday school? Well, we had a tremendous boom, of course, in the 50s, into the 60s. In fact, in 1956, 
we had to go to two sessions of Sunday school because we just didn't have room for it. There were just too many. We had one at 920, we had one at 1010, and then in 1965, we had a count of 799 children enrolled in Sunday school. I have full faith that we will continue to thrive because I have been a part of two confirmation classes now and VBS for a couple of years and I have seen the outpouring of faith and support that we give our youth and this community and I have no doubt at all that we will continue to grow and continue to thrive and continue to make an impact for this community and continue to grow this congregation in total. I don't know if any of you know this, but last year, this past summer in VBS, we had reached a high of, I think it was 201? I think it was 201 kids show up one, through, throughout the week. And that just proves that we are not a dying congregation and that we will continue to thrive and continue to grow, and there's no doubt about that. So with that, I will turn it over to Pastor Andrea, who has a few things to say about what is coming up. Noah, um, Noah, when he said he's been involved with two confirmation classes, Noah is one of our senior high uh, students who's been a confirmation small group leader for the last two years. And that's one of the things we're doing is having our senior high kids serve back into confirmation. Um, and it's been a great learning experience for the eighth graders, but also for Noah. And, uh, and at last we had Emily Rogers as well. I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about missions. And um, Adam started me off right, kind of stole some of the thunder, but that's okay, I'll jump off of it. Um, as you know, we've had a, a couple really fantastic years of mission. Two years ago, we, Wendy Schaefer told me when I got here, go big or go home. And so we went to Jamaica and we went big. We're not going home. <laughs> um, last year, I, uh, I thought it was a stretch if we would get 40 kids to go on mission, and we took 63 junior and senior high kids on mission from this church last year. <laughs> this coming summer, we're, due, uh, we're going to return to Catadupa, Jamaica, and we also have a mission for Arizona. And I just want to say, congregation, um, these missions are only possible because of your support and all of the ways that you come and support the youth. I, we talked about this the other day in the office. Y'all raised the money for the van in two Sundays. Thank you so much. The kids aren't the future, they are the church. Thank you for everything you do to make sure our children and our youth are growing in faith right now so that they can withstand that faith and carry that faith forward. Um, so thank you for that. We've got a lot of great things going on with youth. And, but I also wanted to talk about some other things that God is doing. Adam mentioned uh, Stephen Neal and, and himself, how this congregation has for years raised up the next generation of leaders for the next era. And you all know that Chad has stepped into seminary, but we have another seminary and about to get rolling as well. And um, that is a tremendous gift that we give to the church, not just this one, but the church universal. And my prayer is that somewhere in this room tonight, there might be a young person who is feeling that call because of what you do and how you live out your faith and how you equip us, myself, Pastor Joel, and Chad to live out our faith as well and share it with you. Pray big. Pray big over the kids and the youth of this congregation because God has not failed this church and he will not start now. And so um, I want to thank you for the, I live in the parsonage too. 
Thanks for the bathroom. <laughs> um, but I, I want to thank you for, for all you do to support our ministries here, everything that we've got going on, the ways that you encourage and dream, and Joel's going to come up in a minute, in a second, five seconds, um, <laughs> and tell you a little bit more about what God is doing. But I, I told you a couple weeks ago in the message on our 140th celebration, what if I told you God is doing more than we can see? Say that with me. What if I told you God is doing more than we can see? A couple years ago, our, our theme was dream big. And that's what Chad, uh, Joel is going to share with you here in just a second. Before I get into that part, I just want you guys to realize that um, if you take the number 140 and divide it by 2, how much is that? If you take the number 70 and divide it by 2, how much is that? Two weeks ago, we had one of our staff members that celebrated 35 years of service at the church. D. Comacher, would you come forward, please? Well, that means there's one on every four years that St. Paul, for St. Paul has had a church, D. Comacher has been a part of it. To know that um, as a gift to you from the congregation, um, that we're going to provide about $300 so that you can go and use your Nebraska golf passports. Um, incidentally, those are the real passports you can't buy them online for another two weeks, and that's not a real check because we didn't want her to find out about it until we did this. But they're coming. Let me just say that um, over the course of the time that I've been here at First St. Paul's, I've had a wonderful opportunity to work with some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people on staff. And um, I guess I just um, want you guys to know, Stephen, thank you for your words. Appreciate it. Um, incidentally, um, you weren't the worst intern. Okay? Um, Frank and I had the opportunity that when Frank found out that I was coming, two weeks later he accepted a call somewhere else. <laughs> and Adam, you will always remain my favorite NASA Lucifer period. <laughs> I want you guys to sing with me for a second. Um, my guess is, is that it's a song you know. And um, it goes like this. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Um, that actually becomes relevant for us because in the midst of us talking about all of the things that First St. Paul has done and all of the things that First St. Paul has been, I also want you to know what First St. Paul is thinking about. We're going to talk a little bit about people who are going to seminary some of the individuals who are going to be doing that. We've talked a little bit about some of the mission trips and things that were going on. Um, I don't know if you guys know that um, ever since I got here 13 years ago, um, I have been interested in thinking about whether or not it would be possible for us to be able to do a ministry with people who um, are Hispanic. And uh, when Kim and I first moved here, what we noticed is that um, when we got stuff from the school district, that it didn't come just in English. 
I want you to know that over the last number of years, what we figured out is that 30% um, you know, of the kids who go to Hastings public schools, when they go home, they don't speak English. Did you guys know that? Um, it's actually a full 22% of them that speak Spanish. And the reason that I was interested in that is because it's 140 years, and we've been doing ministry for 100 and... Well, we're not doing anything to reach that population right now, because back in 1878, we were a bunch of German white people. But that's, that's not what these things is anymore. And the problem is, is that I'm not really good at... Uh, I mean, I can order tacos. Burritos, um, fajitas is about my limit, you know. I mean, the problem is finding the leader. But because we've been interested in this and we've been thinking about doing some of these things, I want you to know that a number of weeks ago, um, Pastor Andrea and I and um, a number of other people from the congregation, um, Deanna Tao, um, Lisa Tao, uh, Lisa Tao, um, we, we had the opportunity of going to our national church gathering that was in Des Moines. And when we were there, I went to a workshop, and actually, um, Pastor Andrea decided that she was going to show up there too, and, um, and so did Deanna Tao, and it was on starting Hispanic ministries. And, um, and I want you to know that I know that Pastor Andrea and I have a little bit different recollection of what that workshop was. My recollection was that they were talking about starting Hispanic ministries, and they were telling me anything I didn't know, and I don't know anything about that. And I was frustrated, and I thought about whether I was going to go see a different workshop, but I didn't. At the end of the workshop, the leader ended up introducing a number of people that were there, and talked about some people who had some Hispanic ministries that they were doing in their congregations, and some people that we can contact as far as being people that might be resources for us, and we were thinking about doing that. And then what happened was is that they said, here's a young man who um, is interested in actually, he's, he's done some Hispanic ministry in Canada, and he's done some Hispanic ministry um, in to Coleman, Washington. And they said, um, if you would be interested in talking with him, and so um, we slipped him a note, and they said, can you have a conversation with us after? Take me to Zombie Burger. That's, that's exactly right. And so that conversation went well, so we took him out to dinner, we went to Zombie Burger, because apparently Pastor Andrea knows about Zombie Burgers. <laughs> and, um, and, and we met this Colombian guy named Edwin. And he started telling us about how he had done some of these other ministries and how he was interested in starting one up in the United States again, but that he was on his way back to Colombia as soon as the conference was over and wasn't sure what the future held for him, but he was an ordained ministry pastor. And we started asking him whether he would be interested in doing some bivocational work and whether or not he'd be interested in being a tent maker. I don't know if any of you guys know what that means, but it means that he would work part-time at the church and he would work part-time in the community. And, um, and, and, and he wanted to know if we were interested in exploring things with him. And I told him that, um, that we were good. The only thing we didn't have was the money. But we kind of continued the conversation with what was happening. And um, as we continued to talk with him, we ended up saying things like, um, you know, I understand that everybody who is Hispanic isn't the same. Some of them come from Mexico, and some of them come from Puerto Rico, and some of them come from Colombia. And I said, you're Colombian. And, um, I think most of the people who are in our community are, are Mexican, and he said, that's okay, when I was in Tacoma, I learned the accent. <laughs> um, actually, I can tell you a lot of things in there. One of the things when we were sitting in dinner was that uh, he was telling us about being a Lutheran in Colombia. And he said that uh, he comes from Bogota. And Bogota is a city of nine million people. And he explained to us that um, there was a full five to six hundred of them that were Lutheran. And about that time, I started fading out of the conversation. And I said, I think I remember when I was like 30 years ago in seminary. That before Kim and I got married, I was living in the dorms of Mendota Hall of Wartburg Seminary. And I'm just sure that there was a guy who lived across the hall from me that was Colombian. And I'll be darned if I didn't think he was from Bogota. And so, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, what are the chances? It's only a city of nine million people. So I said, you know, about 25 years ago, I was in seminary or so at uh, Wartburg Seminary, and um, I went to seminary with a guy lived across the hall from him, and uh, his name was Nathan Isle, and he goes, oh yeah, Liz also. He and my dad went to seminary together. <laughs> we finished our conversation. 
conversation with Hermione, walking back towards his hotel. So that, and we're about two blocks from his hotel, two blocks from the one I was staying in, the we were staying in. And I said, you know, I want to continue the conversation with you, but can we pray together? And we um, prayed together in the middle of the street, in the middle of the morning. And uh, I started turning around and he said, uh, I'd love to start ministry with you guys. Um, exactly where in the United States are you? <laughs> because we forgot to tell him that we were from Nebraska. <laughs> I have no idea where this is going. What I want you to know is that Edwin Mendebelso is watching our worship services right now on Facebook Live every week. And we're in conversation. I have talked with the church council about whether or not starting a Hispanic ministry could be possible. I've talked with the foundation about whether or not there might be some seed money that would be able to come forward. How many of you guys think that we should try to reach 22% of the kids that are in Hastings? <laughs> How many of you guys think that God works in living here in the land? I want you to know that if you've been sitting over here at the pastor's table, we had a conversation that was going on about how many different interim ministries there are and everything like that. I want you to know that right now, you've got um, me as a pastor, you've got Pastor Andrew as a pastor, you've got Chad Stepney to be a pastor, you've got another person who is going to be entering seminary that's going to be becoming a pastor, and we've got a guy from Columbia that wants to come and be a pastor, and we might have too many pastors. <laughs> but I think God's good. What is that uh, Pastor Andrea said? God is doing God is doing more than we can see. Or another way of saying some of that stuff is that um, when Pastor Andrea preached at the service that we have for 140 years, she talked about rear view in the <coughs> Well, how many of you guys think that it's good that we've done a little rehearsing of our history here tonight? How many of you guys think it's better that we're actually also focusing on the fact that unless Jesus comes again in the next 140 years, we might be here. <laughs> There's still a lot of things to work out with that story with that. There's funding for us to have to find a place to live. You'd have to get a visa in order to be able to get there, and it's all real complicated. But I want you guys to know that when we're talking about what per St. Paul says, we're not talking about what we were. We're talking about what we're going to be. Because God's doing more than what we know. And quite frankly, sometimes that's really awesome and a little bit scary. Anyway, um, I think that I was asked to end this. We're talking about faithfulness and doing what they really about this um, If you don't remember, that's why I brought my hat. It's good for you. I believe in God, the Father, and my creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's holy son of God who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered by the conscious father, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He is seated at the dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge us the living in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks this day for all those people who have gone before us, the great cloud of witnesses of this congregation and others. And we ask this day that you would inspire us to become a part of that great cloud of witnesses for those who come after us. for 140 years. However long you need us, we're there. In Jesus' name. Amen.
that that evening in, in our hotel lobby was like a total God thing, wasn't it, Joel? Total weird Jesus juice shakes and goosebumps and like what just happened? Oh, you know God and stuff. <laughs> I just have a few announcements. First of all, before you leave tonight, um, take a moment to help kind of stack up or pick up the chairs and place them on the tables. You can uh, help clear off. We've got a great thank all the people that served and planned. Um, wanted to draw your attention to a few things. Next Wednesday, we will meet back again at church for Ichthus. And so um, we've got a meal on Wednesday night. Give it another Good. Um, so we've got ICTUS next week. We want to let you know that we have some new studies, studies starting in January. There's a young men's study that's taking up. They're going to start 33 or fight by Craig Rochelle in January. We've got an Ephesians study starting in January. The women's study continues in January. We've got lots of opportunities, adults, to learn confirmation and kids ministry stuff. We'll uh, be back at uh, church next Wednesday. On your little flyer here, which you may or may not have anymore, we want to invite you back to the Thanksgiving service in two weeks. Um, how many of you came to the Thanksgiving service last year where we talked about stories of Thanksgiving? We've got four people who are going to be sharing about how God is good. Um, so please plan to join us for Thanksgiving. This is, and, and tell your friends, invite your friends. If you got asked to speak, invite people to come hear you. Um, so that is on the 21st at 7. The week after that, we're starting, um, we'll be doing an Advent, we're, we're, we're studying Advent across the church this year in children's ministry with the children's worship service, with the Christmas, um, going into Christmas time, we've got the first Christmas story with the birth of Christ, we'll be really digging into Advent, and then in January, we'll start, um, we'll revisit some of the stewardship things of, of body and mind and spirit and giving, and so that will happen. But we thought it would be a good thing because um, seminarians, they need your prayers. Oh, thank you, Chad. Please pray for him. But we wanted to tell you our other seminarian or person who's applying for seminary is Brawley White. And so, um, stand up for Jesus. <laughs> Y'all, when, 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 when we say that Jesus changes everything. We have two gentlemen here that are indicators that Jesus changes everything. And so um, we're praying for you. Keep praying for them and encouraging them in their, in, in their working and also seminary. And I believe that's all of our announcements. Yeah, you've got one more thing too. You have a child over there. They are not going to release them. You have to go pick them up, okay? And, and make sure that, oh, What's that? Meat. Oh, there's meat. So take the meat. Don't leave your children. We're, we're off duty shortly. And now let's stand for the benediction. We end this evening with God's promises and God's hope and God's blessing over us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he, may he make his face to shine upon you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs>